Hello everyone, my name is Bill Grabert. Welcome to the Tuliomi Nature and You lecture series. It's a monthly lecture series. Normally we do it at the public libraries in Woodland and Davis. During the COVID times, we're doing it online. So tonight's topic is rangeland management with Grace Woodmansee and Julia Shaw. Before I turn it over to Grace to start, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Tuliomi. For those of you that don't know Tuliomi, we are a conservation nonprofit organization based in Woodland. And our uh, focus area is the inner coast range, the northern inner coast range of California. So that is the, those are the mountains that you see on the west side of the Sacramento Valley. So going all the way up from the San Francisco Bay Area up into the Trinity Alps, Cascade Mountains. Um, so Tuliomi does a, a lot of different things. We do outdoor education, we do uh, public education, we actually own some land that we we are conserving. But the the big thing that we want is just to get people outside and enjoy the land that we have in this area. It's kind of an unknown area and uh, we'd love to get people to get out there and get to know it better. The, the heart of this area is the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument, which um, coming up very soon has its five year anniversary. So happy anniversary to the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument. I also want to encourage you guys to take a look at the Tuliomi website uh, on the YouTube version of this recording. There will be um, a link down in the description, as well as some links to some of the, the items talked about in this lecture. So at this time, I would like to turn it over to Grace um, to tell you guys about rangeland management. Thank you, Grace. Well, thank you for inviting us um, to speak this evening. We're really excited to have the opportunity to talk to, to Leomi members tonight about um, a topic that's really important to both of us, and that's rangeland management. So specifically, um, we'll be discussing how ranchers are helping to manage and protect these important landscapes under the pressures of a changing world. My name is Grace Woodmancy, and Julia Shaw and I work together as grad students in the same lab at UC Davis. Um, so we'll start by defining rangeland, what it looks like in California, and where Julia and I fit in in terms of our research, before moving into the main portion of our talk that will address this idea of change on the range. Um, so before we begin, as grad students at UC Davis, we want to acknowledge that the university was built on stolen Patwin land. Um, we encourage reflection and action on how we can begin to repair the damage and pain caused by those who colonize this land and whose actions we continue to benefit from today. So what makes a rangeland? As you can see, um, rangelands are defined by three broad characteristics, grazers, forage for those grazers, um, and mostly natural inputs to support forage growth. So in other words, these are rain-fed landscapes that are not intensively managed. Um, so in terms of a technical definition, rangeland is defined as uncultivated land that provides the necessities of life for grazing and browsing animals. Um, and these landscapes are uncultivated due to their physical limitations. So they're either too steep, too hot, too cold, or too dry to support crops. Um, and instead, rangelands are dominated by grasses, both native and introduced, and also shrubs and trees. However, just because rangelands can't sustain crops um, doesn't mean that they aren't valuable. In fact, quite the opposite is true. Rangelands provide numerous environmental and social benefits, including clean water, wildlife habitat, open space, recreation, and of course serve as a critical source of forage for both wild and domestic grazers. Um, and in turn, these grazing animals can serve as a management tool to maintain or enhance the functioning of these landscapes and the environmental and social benefits that they support. Environmental and social benefits that we discussed. So um, 
Let's take a look at what rangeland looks like in California specifically, um, as over half of our state is classified as range. Um, so I'll take just a moment to orient you to the figure on the right hand side on this map of California. So the darker green color represents um, public rangeland, which is typically managed um, by a federal agency, um, either the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management. And the lighter green color represents privately owned rangeland. Um, so as you can see, a lot of that lighter green color is, um, is concentrated around the Central Valley, meaning we have a lot of private rangelands um, kind of in this area. And in addition, it's, to, it's important to consider um, that as the most populous uh, state in the nation, California has a lot, a lot of large urban centers surrounded by suburbs and a lot of development. So our state is really showcasing the fact that um, rangelands are often at the center of kind of the wildland, agricultural, um, and urban nexus of these landscapes. Um, also in California, um, 34 million acres of range are grazed, so over 60% um, of our rangelands, and that goes to supporting a three billion dollar a year cattle and sheep industry. So this has implications for rural, um, for rural communities, for food security, and our state economy as a whole. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so across the board in California, rangelands are defined by their diversity, um, whether that be the ecosystem um, type they represent or the activities that these landscapes support. So uh, California's Mediterranean climate and topography interact to create the diverse rangeland ecosystems we see across our state. And we've kind of highlighted some of those key landscapes on this slide here. Um, so everything from our annual grasslands and oak woodlands to the mountain meadows of the Sierra Nevada, um, all the way to the intermountain habitat that we see in the northeastern part of the state, um, and of course the sagebrush steppe that dominates the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada. And each of these rangeland types have um, different plant communities, soil types, and receive um, both different amounts and types of precipitation and are therefore managed differently, um, whether or not that management involves grazing. Uh, so as we discussed earlier in our definition of what rangeland is, um, rangelands are a critical source of forage for grazing animals, and in turn, these grazing animals can serve as a management tool to maintain or enhance the functioning of um, rangelands and the ecosystem services they support. So ruminants like cows and sheep can process um, the grasses that we find on rangelands that contain high concentrations of cellulose. Um, so these grasses, of course, are inedible to humans, um, but livestock grazing makes use of the forage produced by rangelands and in turn provides a high quality source of protein for humans. So because of this connection between livestock grazing and rangeland, I'd like to take a second um, just to talk about the production cycle of beef cattle. So um, beef production is composed of three main sectors or phases of production. Um, that would be the cow-calf, uh, the stalker sector, and then the finishing phase. So the cow-calf uh, sector focuses on managing a mother cow herd. And um, each year, a cow is expected to have one calf. Um, that calf is raised on the ranch until it's weaned and then sold to a stalker operator. And the goal of the stalker operator is to develop frame size and skeletal muscle of these animals um, before they enter the finishing phase. So this is a relatively short phase of production in terms of the life cycle. Um, and then finally, the goal of the finishing phase is to grow cattle to maturity before they're slaughtered. Um, and about three quarters of, um, of cattle are finished in a feedlot and a quarter are finished on, um, on grass, which typically takes a little longer between six and 10 months. So the first two phases of the production cycle, the cow-calf sector and the stalker sector, rely on grass and rangeland to feed cattle. And these first two phases also make up the majority um, of the life cycle. So that means that cattle are spending the majority of their lives eating grass. And in California, ranchers are typically raising cattle as um, cow-calf operators 
stalker operators or a combination of the two. So in a 2011 survey of over 450 California ranchers, about two thirds of respondents reported that they were cow-calf operators and about one third um, were both cow calf and stalker operators. So kind of our takeaway here is that all cattle, regardless of how they are finished, spend the majority of their lives eating grass on range. And the vast majority of ranchers are raising cattle as either cow calf or stalker operators, meaning that they rely on rangeland to support their herds. So again, just making the connection here that ranching and rangeland are very related. Um, so where do we fit into all of this? Um, as I mentioned earlier, Julia and I work in the same lab at UC Davis as graduate students. Um, and we work in UC Rangelands, which is a cooperative extension lab. Um, and cooperative extension is a branch of the UC system that was developed to get sort of um, the cutting edge ag research that's conducted at the university level into the hands of the farmers and ranchers that can use this information on their operations. So cooperative extension is really a conduit between um, the university and the producer. So our research um, is applied and focuses on the rancher as an end user of our results. So um, like I said, my name is Grace and I'm currently finishing up a master's degree in agronomy. Um, and my research focuses on managing drought on rangeland. So I use both ecological and social data to try to understand not only rangeland landscapes, but how ranchers manage these landscapes and make decisions. Um, and this information is important because it helps us to understand how to best support ranchers as they manage through extreme disturbances such as drought. And I'm Julia. Hi everyone, if you haven't seen me yet. So I am finishing up my PhD in ecology and my research focuses on rangeland and grassland restoration. And I'm specifically looking to research cost-effective methods for restoring grasslands to increase native biodiversity and also focusing on prescribed burns and targeted grazing as a way to manage invasive plant species on rangelands and these Invasive plant species are a huge threat to our rangeland ecosystems because they're harming both the ranching operations as well as our environmental goals. Oops. Not sure why my computer won't advance today. Um, so, Although Julia and I have different research interests, um, the through line of our work and motivation as scientists is in managing rangelands as healthy multiple use landscapes for the benefit of all stakeholders. Um, so everyone from folks that enjoy hiking and camping on rangelands to the ranchers that are involved in managing them um, with livestock grazing. So if we think back to the phases of production that we discussed earlier, the work that Julia and I do um, is impacting the first two sectors of the beef industry directly because livestock in both of these phases rely on grazing lands for forage. Um, so throughout the rest of the presentation, when we refer to ranches or grazing, these are the phases of um, beef production that we're talking about, and we will not be addressing the finishing phase in this presentation. So um, we know a bit about what rangelands are, what they look like in California, and how livestock production and rangeland management are related. Um, so now I'd like to dive into our main topic for today, which addresses how range is defined by change. So we're seeing change impact rangelands and the ranchers that manage them in three broad ways, um, through climate change, land use change, and value change. So at the global scale, climate change impacts all aspects of natural resource management and ag production, including the management of rangelands. So um, when we think of the most destructive broad scale challenges um, for these landscapes, drought and wildfire are definitely at the top of that list. And although climate change related disturbances such as drought and wildfire have enormous consequences for rangeland livestock producers, um, there's sometimes a perception that ranchers are not as engaged with climate change as other folks. Um, however, research supports, in fact, the opposite. And I'd like to take 
uh, a little bit of time to share some of that research with you now. So these data were collected as a part of a statewide survey of over 450 ranchers in 2011, and that study was led by Dr. Leslie Roach. Um, so surveyed ranchers were asked to rank their level of agreement to the statements on the left-hand side of this figure um, on a scale of one through five, one being that they strongly agree with the statement, five being they strongly agree with the statement. Um, and some of these statements are a little bit tricky um, because they have some do double negatives. So I'll just start with the first one. So um, in response to this statement, climate change is not an important consideration when developing options for my ranching business relative to other issues. On average, respondents disagreed with that statement, um, meaning that the surveyed ranchers represented here think that climate change is important to consider when making decisions for their operations. Um, moving to the second statement, I do not believe that the future climate will be any different from my past experience. Again, on average, respondents disagreed with this statement, meaning that surveyed ranchers believe that in the future, they will in fact be operating under a different climate. Um, and finally, in these last two questions, we see that on average, surveyed ranchers are confident in their skills to manage for long-term drought and that they are also interested in learning more about climate change and its impacts on the ranching industry. So the takeaway here is that ranchers are aware of the effects of climate change on their operations and motivated to find ways to address um, these climate change related concerns and disturbances such as drought. So it's important to understand the perceptions and management strategies of ranchers because rangeland livestock producers are among the first to experience the effects of drought. Um, so ranchers are really on the front line of adapting to climate change as they are managing and relying on a rain-fed resource, which is rangelands, to support their operations. Um, and although ranching families have a lot of experience and insight into coping with large-scale disturbances such as drought, um, the severity and duration of recent droughts um, has really tested their ability to adapt under extraordinary conditions. So this is where research and the support of agencies such as Cooperative Extension comes into play. So research efforts are currently focused on working with ranchers to figure out the best way to adapt to these challenges and to protect both ranch and range sustainability. And in addition, this research helps provide science-based information to policymakers about how to support management strategies that are really working for folks on the ground. So one example of this type of research um, is actually my thesis work that I'm doing right now, which examines how California's historic drought influenced drought adaptation for rangeland livestock producers across the state. So the goal of my research is to provide insight into what worked and what didn't work for ranchers that managed through California's historic drought so that we can be better prepared um, for the next drought. And we're, we're accomplishing this goal through a series of interviews um, and in talking to ranchers about their experiences. So I pulled these images from the US Drought Monitor to highlight how severe the 2012 to 2016 drought was across California. So the dark orange on these maps represents severe drought, um, the bright red represents extreme drought, and the dark red represents exceptional drought. And as you can see, in 2014 and 2015, over half of the state was classified as being under extreme or, except, or exceptional drought conditions. Um, so the severity and duration of California's drought really tested the ability of ranchers to adapt under extraordinary circumstances. And by that, I mean not just managing through an extreme water shortage or several years of low precipitation, but a combination of the two. And these sorts of severe multi-year droughts um, are real game changers. They restrict all resources and often painful trade-offs have to be made by ranching families to keep um, their ranch in operation. So far-reaching impacts of extreme drought include reductions in ground and surface water, um, spread of invasive plant species, and then of course um, restrictions in terms of forage production on rangeland. <clears throat> 
So all of this information emphasizes that ranching um, is threatened by climate change and its associated broad scale disturbances. And because of this, ranchers are, are thinking globally and acting locally to be a part of the climate change solution. And I'd like to share one example of how, um, how a ranch is currently um, doing that. So the Chileno Valley Ranch was established in 1862 and is owned by Sally and Mike Gale in Marin County. The Gales took over as ranch managers in 1993 and made it a priority to address some of the issues that had arisen on the property over time, including um, degraded riparian areas. So um, the Gales were very motivated to center all of their restoration efforts on the ultimate goal of sequestering more carbon um, through restoring key areas on their ranch. So they took on several restoration projects to achieve this goal one of which was partnering with their local resource conservation district to stabilize creek banks um, with plantings which helped improve water quality, decrease um, sediment deposition, and improve uh, overall stream habitat for native fish populations. And they've also partnered with other agencies such as Cooperative Extension um, to monitor the effects of these restoration efforts over time. So as the connection between ranching range and climate change becomes more clear, the ecosystem services that working ranchers support are becoming um, more recognized and more valued. And there is a lot of um, inspiring stories of collaborative research and restoration efforts, such as the Gales, that highlight how ranchers are engaging in managing rangeland to be a part of the climate change solution. All right, um, so now I'll hop in to talk a bit about our next big change that we want to touch on, which is land use change. And so I'm focusing on a study that was done by Sleater and colleagues with the US Geological Survey. And um, these scientists created a model that projected how land use change would happen through 2100. And so before we dive into the specifics of what this model found, I wanna just go through how they created this model a little bit briefly. So they took information from the past, from a time period of 2001 to 2014, about how often one land use type changed to another land use type. So for example, how, what was the rate of change between cropland to urban ecosystems, rangeland to cropland, etc., for all the different possible combinations. And then they use that information to predict forward and forecast how land would change over time. So of course, that in and of itself means that this model has the assumption that the rate of land, land use change will stay the same. And so this is what we call a business as usual model. You may have heard this term used in things like climate change models. And these kinds of models are really useful because they're kind of a way to say, okay, if we keep having the same behavior, if we keep making the same decisions, what do we expect our outcome to be? And if that outcome isn't something that we actually want to happen, then it's a really great way to reflect on what we can change so that we can have a different outcome. So diving into the specifics of this model, um, if you look at this animation that I have up there, um, so this is zoomed in on the Central Valley, which I'm sure many of you recognize. And the dark gray color that you see there is an urban and developed area. The orange represents cropland. The light yellow is rangeland. In this case, that's the foothills. So that's a lot of grassland, oak woodland, maybe some shrubland. And then the green around that is forest. So what we see happening, if we're looking at this animation over time, is that as urban areas are expanding, they're pushing into the cropland. And then in turn, that cropland is expanding into the rangeland. But what we see is if we focus in on the rangeland, the rangeland is not expanding. And that's because it's hitting this brick wall of forest. So it has nowhere to go. And now this isn't necessarily a bad thing, the fact that the forest isn't changing over time, like we don't wanna advocate deforestation here. But it is just to point out that rangeland is really just being squeezed out of this landscape by urban expansion under this model. And the authors actually did a few other models where they incorporated population change, 
And even with low population, um, population increase, they still found that rangelands were the most negatively affected ecosystems in California. So why should this concern us as people who care about the environment and who care about our open spaces? Well, just by the nature of existing, working ranches are preserving important grassland, oakland, and shrubland habitat. So we know that grasslands alone provide habitat for 73 state or federally listed species. So those are species that are endangered, threatened, or species of special concern. And we also know that grasslands have a really diverse flora, so lots of different plant species. And they, native grasslands actually support about 40% of California's total native plant species. So if you pause to think about all of the different ecosystem types we have here in California, and all of the different native plants that are in that ecosystem, it's pretty incredible that grasslands have 40% of those native plant species. So it's clear that these ecosystems are really important biologically and ecologically. And if these rangelands were to be turned into cropland, many of these benefits would go away. So remember that the reason that cropland tends to be in the valley is because that's where that nutrient rich soil is, like Grace touched on before. And so rangeland soil in the foothills does not tend to be as nutritious. And also because it's in this hilly environment, it's a little, it's a lot harder to operate machinery on it. So this means that when rangeland is converted to cropland, not only are we losing all that diversity when all the crops are planted, we are also having to input a bunch of water, input a bunch of nutrients, which just further disrupts the system. And remember from our definition of rangelands, rangelands are just relying on natural systems. So when we're converting to cropland, we're having all this extra, extra input that can disrupt ecosystems in all kinds of different ways. But it's not only that these ranches are preventing development and habitat fragmentation. There also are ranchers out there who are actively working to enhance these habitats and to directly manage for species and specific environmental goals. So we wanna highlight a couple of these ranches that are enhancing their land for different conservation and environmental goals. And so the first one of these is the Coatman Ranch. And this is located in Alameda County. It's a cow-calf operation that was established back in 1918 in what was once a rural area. But as you can imagine now being in the Bay Area, their land is under intense pressure for land use change. So it's currently bordered by a golf course, a highway, and a bunch of mansions. But despite all this pressure, the Coatmans are dedicated to keeping their ranch operational and also dedicated to good environmental stewardship. So the Coatmans manage about 31 of these acres um, of their ranch, specifically for the California tiger salamander. And this parcel of land contains both a pond as well as an upland habitat. And so for those of you who don't know, the California tiger salamander is a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. And it also has two populations in Santa Barbara and Sonoma counties that are listed as endangered. And so the grazing plan on this land has been formed in partnership with the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS. And it's specifically made to benefit and support this California tiger salamander. And California tiger salamanders live in burrows, often created by ground squirrels, and then they travel down to ponds when they're ready to breed. So it's really important to have both this upland habitat and this pond in this ecosystem. And we found, um, and so US, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has found that generally California tiger salamander habitat is compatible with light to moderate grazing, because it keeps the grass short enough for easier access to these burrows that they live in and also to the ponds, but also is, keeps the grass long enough that they aren't exposed to predators. So the Coatmans also manage for the Calippe silver spot butterfly, which is an endangered species. 
And this species of butterfly will only lay its eggs on a very specific kind of flower, the viola pendunculata, which is often called a Johnny jump up. And when we have this kind of relationship between a butterfly and a plant, um, the plant is referred to as the host plant. And so once the butterfly lays its eggs and these eggs hatch, then this particular plant serves as the sole food source for caterpillars until they can form their cocoons and become butterflies. So it's really important for us to have this flower in order to have this butterfly population continue. And the grazing that happens on this land is done in a very specific way to encourage the Johnny Jump Up flowers to grow. And grazing is really helpful in this case because it breaks up the thick litter that a lot of these non-native annual grasses form. And this allows the Johnny Jump Ups to get enough light to germinate, establish, and then flower. And then finally, the Coatmans also have worked with the local Audubon Society to protect the Western Bluebird by installing over 92 nest boxes on their ranch and also installing safety ramps on all of their water troughs that the cows use um, so that the birds can also use these as sources of water safely. And so a quick note about the California tiger salamander and the Johnny Jump Up conservation projects. So these were made possible by what are called conservation easements. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with these, a conservation easement is an agreement between a landowner and a qualified land trust or a conservation group or a government agency where a landowner will, vo will voluntarily sell certain rights to their land, such as allowing whether or not the property can be developed or the right to manage it for a specific species. Um, but, the, but, the, me, but the rancher still retains ownership of the property. So these easements are a way to prevent rangelands from being developed while still allowing the ranch to stay in the family. And in the case of the Coatmans, these easements are used both to prevent development and to set aside land to manage for specific species. So really, this is a gold standard of environmental stewardship and ranching and, and shows how these two can go hand in hand to protect habitat loss from development. But we also want to highlight that it isn't just the ranches that are close to urban expansion that are doing this kind of environmental stewardship. So the Roberti Ranch is a much more, in a much more rural area in Plumas and Sierra counties, and it's also a cow-calf operation that was established back in 1922. And the Robertis have done a ton of work to try to increase bird diversity on their land. So they've partnered with Cooperative Extension and NRCS to restore 17 acres of wetland habitat that serves as nesting ground for migratory birds like sandhill cranes. And they've also partnered with the Plumas County Audubon Society to do ranch tours with birders so that they can view the many waterfall, waterfowl that use the restored wetland habitat and also other species of interest that they have on their property like burrowing owls. They've also partnered with local educators to install owl boxes, which allow these teachers to come and collect owl pellets underneath that their students can then dissect. So this is just another example of a ranching family that's really passionate about being involved in their local community, collaborating with support agencies, and prioritizing management to preserve and protect critical wildlife habitat. So now getting into our last change, this one is more about the consumer and their relationship to food and now how this relates to what ranchers do on their land. Our values are shaped by the world around us and this is no different when it comes to our attitudes about food. So in terms of climate change, we've seen this global awakening to this need to be responsible stewards of our planet and to manage things in a sustainable way. When thinking about land use change, as urban centers are moving closer to what was once rural ranchers, people are becoming more curious about ranching and what happens there. So these two together have led to a desire of consumers to know where their food is coming from and to ask questions like, is my food being produced in a way that aligns with my values of environmental stewardship and sustainability? And who is my food coming from? Which reflects this desire for a more personal connection with our food systems. 
So how are ranchers adapting to these value changes? Well, in many ways, rancher practices and consumer desires are already aligned when thinking about both environmental stewardship and the desire for a more direct connection with the food system. They just haven't really advertised it until more recently. And we gained some insight into these attitudes in the survey that Grace mentioned earlier of the over 450 California ranchers, of over 450 California ranchers that was conducted by the UC Rangelands Lab. And this survey explored key factors that shape rancher decision-making, perspectives on effective management techniques, and also their concerns. So when thinking about sustainability, and environmental stewardship, we've been highlighting examples of all the opportunities for ranching and environmental goals to work in tandem. Now, of course, there is a negative impact of ranching on the environment that we do want to acknowledge. So the one we hear about in the news the most is methane emission, right, greenhouse gas. However, it's important to keep in mind that livestock, which is not just cattle, but sheep, chickens, and pigs too, account for only around 3% of greenhouse gas emissions in the US, according to the EPA, and that this is an issue that scientists and ranchers are actively working to improve. And we think it's really important to think about the multiple facets of environmental sustainability and stewardship, and to weigh not only the negatives, but also the positives. So in thinking about this stewardship, we've explored examples of specific ranches with good practices that lead to things like carbon sequestration and habitat for important species that we care about. But these aren't just one-off examples. We found in our surveys that, the, that valuing ecology and natural resources of the land is widespread among ranchers throughout California. We found that 97% of ranchers agree that whenever possible, they try to conserve natural resources. And conserving these natural resources is key to having a good ranching operation, as illustrated by this quote from the survey, which I'll read. Ranchers and farmers that aren't ecologists or aren't ecologically prudent, we have a name for them. They call them bankrupt. If you don't take care of your ground, it doesn't take care of you. And part of the reason that many of these ranching families feel this connection to the land is because they've been taking care of them for generations. And in fact, 71% of the survey respondents were at least third generation ranchers. So in this way, ranching and taking care of the land is really a way of life. And I think this quote illustrates that. The best kind of family life you could possibly have would be on a farm or ranch where your kids get to work with you and they're connected to the natural world, caring for animals, plants, where food comes from. And this way of life is already compatible with the demand we're seeing for local and personal connection to food from consumers. And we've seen this demand through avenues like the farm to fork and farm to table movements, such as Sacramento being the farm to fork capital and having events um, in that name. Also, farmers markets and even grocery stores are now selling local meat. And this does seem to be related to the proximity of urban areas to agriculture. A study by Lowe and Bogell in 2011 found that over half of farms with local food sales, which is either direct sales at farmers markets or through CSA boxes or sales to restaurants, were located in metropolitan counties. So this proximity is strengthening the connection between ranchers' access to customers and consumers' demand for local products. And even taking a step back at a broader scale from these, from these proximity-driven markets, keep in mind that according to the USDA, about 92% of the beef produced in the U.S. is sold in the U.S. And 97% of farms and ranches are family-owned. So this means that you can support personal family owned ranches, whether you purchase your meat at a grocery store or a farmer's market. And I think the key here to showcasing ranching and how it can be aligned with our societal values is all about communication. And I think that ranchers are starting to wake up to this. So this is a quote here by Tim Coatman, who owns the ranch that we discussed previously. So he said of ranchers, we need to share our story 
we need to let people know that multi-generations of ranchers have actually been doing a really good job of providing stewardship. We just haven't spent a lot of time talking about it because we're not that way generally. Um, so where do we go from here and how can we move forward and keep improving in a way where our food production on ranchers reflects our societal values while also allowing ranches to thrive? Um, we really think that this all gets down to relationship building, um, whether that be at the community level or um, with scientists, researchers, and ranchers. So at the community level, um, things like demystifying ranching, um, or public support for conservation e easements, or even just a one-on-one -on -one connection with local customers at a farmer's market are all really important ways to do this. Um, and then in terms of the science level, uh, we think that partnerships with ranchers, agencies, and scientists will be key for finding applied solutions to these complex challenges. And as members of Tuleomi, um, you're already in, very aware of how important open space is and, and also very engaged in conserving it, um, which is awesome and really showcases how all of you are already contributing um, to kind of building this bridge between um, science, ranching, and the general public. And so in conclusion, today we've talked about how climate change, land use change, and value change are defining issues in range management, or that range is defined by change. We've also talked about how ranching goals and environmental goals can be aligned, and there are many opportunities for win-wins that we as scientists, as members of the public, and as Californians who care about our open spaces and environment can be supportive of and help to find. And finally, that finding solutions to these big challenges and changes that we're facing so that we can minimize negative environmental impacts and maximize environmental, environmental benefits on ranches in a way that keeps these ranches operational, is going to hinge on partnerships between ranchers, the public, and scientists. And so with that, we wanna say thank you so much for listening and for inviting us to speak. Um, we are happy to answer any questions, and also if you think of questions later, um, you, can, you are free to email either of us. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Grace and Julia. Uh, we have a question. I don't know if you guys are monitoring the chat, but um, the invasive species. Can you guys say anything about that? Yeah, I can, I can speak to this a bit. Um, so the question is, can you talk about invasive plant species and how grazing and fire, pra fire abatement practices affect that? Yeah, so some of you may have seen like goats, for example, out on the side of the highway grazing away. Um, and a lot of times this is done as a way to abate fire. So you're reducing those fine fuel loads. And when we think about invasive plant species, a lot of these species do create these fine fuel loads that are taking over entire ecosystems. And so if we can use grazing as a tool to get rid of these invasives, to thin them out, and also to, to reduce a lot of that big litter and thatch buildup, then this also really helps to reduce the risk of these big catastrophic wildfires that we see. So just in, in general, is grazed land less affected by invasive species because it is, is kept down? No, so generally if you're going to be using grazing as a tool to manage invasive species, it requires what's called targeted grazing, which is actually something I do in my research. So you really need to look at the life cycle of that particular invasive species and see whether there's a nice convergence of when that plant is the most palatable to the grazer and when it's most vulnerable. So you ideally want to hit the plant at a time before it reproduces, so it can't put more seeds into the soil bank, right? Um, but also, a lot of times, um, these invasive species aren't palatable or they have spines, like you think of yellow star thistle, for example, it gets really spiny, 
you think of Medusa head, which is what I work with, that grass has a lot of silica in it, especially later on. So you want to graze it early. Um, so you have to really be thoughtful about it. If you just throw grazers onto land, then, you know, you could make the problem worse. So you have to be careful about that and think about it. So it involves moving them around quite a bit. Yeah, and just like really understanding the ecology of what's going on, of both the grazer and, and the life cycle of that, of that animal, or of that plant species, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, couple more questions. Grace, uh, do you want to take the next yes. one? Yes, so I'm seeing this one um, from William asking, what are challenges for ranchers needing help from the public? Um, so I, I'm thinking, William, that you're meaning how can um, the general public help in supporting ranchers? And I would say one of the best ways that everyone can do that is um, just by being engaged and understanding what the realities of beef production look like, and then being a good source of information for friends and family members that are seeking that information. Um, as we've kind of mentioned throughout the, this presentation, especially during the value chain section, um, a lot of folks these days are wanting to know where, more about where their meat comes from um, and what sustainable ranching looks like in California and across the West. So um, being, being um, kind of one of those educators out there that are helping connect people to science-based information is really important. Um, and actually, I think I can tackle this next question as well. Um, how can I find out more about feedlots in California and are animals mistreated by being all crowded together? So as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, Julia and I um, research only what happens on grazing lands. I'm definitely not a researcher or an, ex or an expert on what happens in feedlot systems, but I can tell you with certainty that welfare, animal welfare is a priority at every um, kind of production sector of the beef industry that we went through. And there is a lot of information and effort um, and, or a lot of research and effort going into keeping animals um, healthy um, and well provided for and cared for in the, in the finishing phase, as well as in the cow calf and um, stalker phases as well. So uh, animal welfare is a very big priority for beef producers and they take it very seriously. Cows per acre. <laughs> I mean, it, it varies. <laughs> like, I'm sure it depends on the land. Yeah. <laughs> this is kind of a hard one to answer. Um, I mean, you're generally not going to see a ton of cows crowded on acres in California. Like, we have a, quite a bit of open space, if, if that's what you're asking about. Um, I don't know. Do you know if there's an average race? I don't know. It really all gets down to um, how much forage the land type you're operating on produces and what kind of management goals that you have. So for someone that's um, uh, managing um, with, uh, with adaptive grazing or rotational grazing, a stocking rate on an irrigated pasture is going to look a lot different than someone who's managing extensively on a more arid rangeland habitat. So I was going to do this anyway, but I'm going to add some resources to the chat box right now um, to both our UC Rangelands website and also to um, a web page for a new series we have called Working Rangelands Wednesdays that explores um, topics related to um, sort of rangeland livestock production throughout the state. And there's lots of information um, there for you about all sorts of things relating um, to stocking rate and how uh, beef cattle are managed or grazing animals are managed on rangeland. Okay, um, so I can go ahead and take the question about the climate impact of methane from cattle and sheep. Um, and I'm actually going to share my screen for this. Um, let's see. Let's see. Okay, oops, I guess I should push present. There we go. Okay, so when talking about um, methane, right, methane emissions, that's a big topic that we hear about right now um, in the news. And I wanna start with the caveat that like, 
Grace and I, neither of us are experts in um, like digestion of ruminants or even in greenhouse gas cycling. That's just not like either of those scales aren't things we work on. Um, but we do want to say um, that according to the EPA, livestock accounts for about 3% of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. And so, like I said, um, that includes um, not only cattle, but also sheep, chickens, and pigs. And there can be a lot of confusion in the media because there are a lot of numbers flying around, and I'll show a chart that shows some of that uh, in just a minute. Um, but I think it's really important when we're touching on these sensational topics like this to really think about how to be a smart consumer of science in the media, which can be really challenging. Um, so I think it's important to remember the role of scientific consensus. So a lot of times when we're seeing all kinds of numbers flying around that seem really different, um, part of the process of science is that there's constantly studies co going, co or coming out and different people are taking different approaches. Some of those studies are better than others, but kind of the idea is over time, the evidence is going to build in one direction or another, right? And right now with methane, even in the way that we're measuring methane and how it's affecting greenhouse gas is a little bit up in the air and there's scientific debate going on about that. Um, and then also just like beware of sensational news articles, right? Like if these articles are really eliciting strong feelings from you or like making you scared or upset, um, that's always a really good time to take a step back and try to look at the source material that the science is coming from. Um, I often, like I, I recommend if you have a friend who's a scientist who can help you read some of that technical language or you can always email me or Grace to help you out with that um, just to make sure that it's reliable. And also that context is important. So to get into that a little bit, um, this is a chart and this comes from um, actually the Twitter of a climate or of a um, scientist who I want to recommend to all of you um, to look into because she does a lot of work with global greenhouse gas emissions and how that relates to cattle production. Um, her name is Sarah Place. Um, maybe Grace can type her name in the chat box for me. Um, so yeah, her work is really great about all of this stuff. And so she created this chart to show where some of the confusion comes with all these numbers that fly around that are like honestly even confusing to me. So she said that a lot of times all these numbers can get confused because you're not thinking about the context, right? So some, so are you thinking on the global, the regional, the national, or the subnational scale? What are the numbers from? So what I gave you earlier was that 3% from the national scale, all of the U.S. And then also, is it looking at all livestock or just beef or dairy cattle? And also, is it looking at direct emissions versus the life cycle assessment? So the direct emissions is just directly what that animal is producing. Whereas the life cycle assessment is like all aspects of beef production, whether that's the cars transporting them, the factories, just all these different steps that are happening at, during this process. Um, and so that, as you can imagine, those numbers would be higher than direct emissions. So it's important to, to pay attention to which one it's taking into account. And so you can see the difference here where greenhouse gas emissions associated with livestock production globally, so this is all globally, is about 14.5% with a life cycle analysis. And then if you go down to beef production and dairy, it's 5.8 and 2.9% respectively. And then finally, if you break that down even, even further and just look at greenhouse gas emissions associated with North American beef and dairy production, that's only about 1% even with a life cycle assessment of greenhouse gas emissions globally. So you can see how choosing different numbers, oops, sorry, choosing different numbers can really change our perspective on what, what is actually happening in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Hopefully that answered that question. It's very long-winded, sorry. And Julia, while you're on the topic, there's one more question from Carlos that I think fits nicely into this. He's asking the 3% share of GHG in your slide refers only to cattle raised in open range. You know, I'd have to check on that. I think actually because that's a life cycle analysis, that's actually going to be the whole process. 
So um, like we said, cattle generally are, are raised in open range, like all most cows. Um, I think it might also include dairy though. Hold on a sec. Let me talk. Yeah, so let me take that back. So this was both beef production and dairy. So that's both cows and dairies and range cows. Um, and then I see another question here um, from Emily about information resources. So the question is, how do you consider the needs of ranchers that may not be connected with your networks? For example, I would imagine that ranchers that may not have participated in the climate change survey or engaged with the rangelands network um, may have different yet important insights. And you're absolutely correct. Um, there are a variety of ways for ranchers to connect to other ranchers, to scientists, and then to industry um, organizations that help support um, all aspects of production challenges. So we actually found um, that the top five information sources for ranchers are really diverse. Um, the first being ranching community organizations, so resources like um, the California Cattlemen's Association and the California Wool Growers Association. Um, the second um, information resource that's prioritized by ranchers is actually their peer network. So ranchers learn a lot from other ranchers, and that's why some of these support agencies such as Cooperative Extension are really important in terms of um, creating opportunities for ranchers to share their perspectives with others in their community that may or may not be engaged um, in, in rangeland management in other ways. Um, there are also several efforts going on to research um, kind of unique uh, or, or niche kind of uh, aspects of the ranching community. For example, um, some recent work by Kate Munden Dixon focused on first generation ranchers and how um, these folks prefer to get information. Um, and they found, um, she found that uh, first generation ranchers are using different types of networks than traditional ranchers. So um, they're more likely to be younger and they're more first generation ranchers are more likely to be younger and more likely to be women and they're also more likely um, to use things like uh, social media as a peer-to-peer -peer information um, sort of sharing network so there's definitely efforts uh, that are ongoing to try to figure out the best way to share information not just from the university to ranchers but from ranchers to support industries and the university. Like making that information sharing a two-way street is very important also. Can you guys um, say anything about um, rangeland, public rangeland and, and how ranchers access public lands? So public lands allotments are um, an important part of the forage calendar for uh, about 20% of, 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 of livestock producers in California, meaning that um, some part of where their, their grazing resources are coming from throughout the year is coming from a public lands allotment, typically during the summertime. That's a really critical source of forage for grazing animals. Um, so um, people have uh, sort of agreements with different agencies in order to access those allotments. And the leases function in really different ways depending on what agency um, you're, you're leasing that allotment through. But um, yeah, they are, uh, public lands allotments are a critical source of the forage calendar for, for a lot of folks in California and throughout the West. Uh, there's one about Tuliomi properties. I'll answer that real quick. Uh, Tuliomi does own a number of um, properties. Um, not a lot, but a few properties, mostly up in Lake County. Um, and we do have a grazing lease on at least one of our properties, I know. It's one of the more remote ones. We've also worked with local ranchers um, in, in the Yolo County area. We have uh, one trail that we built, the Berryessa Peak Trail, which actually crosses some private land. And so we, we uh, made an arrangement with an easement uh, with a local rancher to let us cross their land on this trail. So we're very happy about that. Uh, another, another project that we're working on is the, the Woodland Regional Park in Woodland. And um, that has been grazed in the past. It's owned by the city of Woodland. Uh, 
it's not currently being grazed and it's it's going to be um, open to the public after the COVID times, probably, yeah, sometime in the future, but it's being developed. Uh, whether or not there'll be future grazing out there, I'm not sure. Um, I think there was another question about goats. <laughs> Everybody likes the idea of goats getting out and eating star thistles, so I think there may be a possibility of that. All right, so another question I'm seeing here is, um, what is your approach when you identify an area that's very unique and sensitive? and would clearly benefit from a carefully considered management plan, e.g. vernal pools, intact, diverse remnant native grassland, etc., especially when it may com conflict with produ productive grazing management. Um, so a few things about this. Um, yeah, I definitely think there are going to be cases when grazing might not be the best option for a landscape. And, and I, I think, you know, that's why it's really important to Think about what the goals are, what the what the intended land uses are for these particular habitats, and and how different management strategies are going to affect it. Um, I will say, in the case of vernal pools, there's actually been some really recent work by Julie, uh, Dr. Julia Michaels, who just came out of UC Davis, um, and she found that grazing did help with diversity in vernal pools and help with um, invasive species and non-native annual species um, that were within that those native pools. So sometimes it seems like things are in conflict, but they aren't. But you know, sometimes they are. So that's why science is so important, right? We really need to think about these things. And I think you're right, like, we need to be very thoughtful with these really sensitive um, systems um, and think about like their evolutionary history. Um, do they have, um, do they have a history of being grazed? Um, and things like that when we're thinking about their use. Um, and I see a question here from uh, Bernadette about what percentage of rangeland actively employs conservation practices, such as those mentioned in the ranches you used as examples. Um, I would have to dig through the research to get you an accurate figure, Bernadette, but um, I'm going to post uh, my and Julia's email addresses in the chat feature. So if you all have questions that we haven't um, been able to get to today, please feel free to email us and we'll do our best um, to get back to you with more specific information. Yeah. And I, I know that um, some uh, cooperative extension county advisors are currently doing a project on how many conservation easements they have. So we may actually have some like good solid numbers for you like pretty soon. I think it's, it's a little hard to keep track of them um, because they're through a lot of different agencies and things. So hopefully soon we'll have more info on that. Okay, let's see. Anything else there you want to address? A lot of so questions. I, yeah, I'm just trying to, pretty pretty much everything. trying to pretty much everything. Still rather curious. Yeah, it's difficult to, you know, address that one. Yeah, I can, I can take a stab at it. I mean, um, so Nick asked, as a non-meat eater myself, I'm still rather curious as to how much more the public should be paying for beef to adequately compensate a rancher for all of the environmental services that their ranch currently provides free of charge. Um, just looking for a rough estimate here. So I don't know that I can actually answer that question because ecosystem services, as you all may know, is like, it's like a whole field, right? Like, and I think that's really a question that we are all grappling with right now because right now we're functioning in an economy where we're not taking into account all of the services that nature is providing for us and all of the value that it's providing to us. It's an externality to that system. And so when we're really trying to think about these things and break it down, like I, it's, it's hard. Um, I know that there's, there's work where they've done things like how much, um, how much does it cost in mitigation for there to be mangroves, right? Or coral reefs intact that are preventing floods with hurricanes and things. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that there are also similar studies on rangelands that I can look into and send to you if you send me an email to try to find like how people are doing this. 
And a lot of the, the challenges with ecosystem services is that um, those, those kind of calculations and payments and evaluations have to be made in a very region specific way. Um, so I think a lot of this gets down to, um, yeah, like region specific research and it's gonna take some time to kind of develop that body of scientific literature. And of course, as our environment continues to evolve and our societal values to continue to evolve, um, those kind of shifts are going to impact how we value different natural resources as well. So I think it's a great question and it's, it's a good thing for everyone to think about um, as, as folks that all enjoy the benefits of rangelands. Um, I, yeah, I think it's a good thing to ponder for sure. But yeah, I, I would just like to echo Julia. Nick, if you want to get in touch with us, we can connect you to some more specific studies. Um, I know of one just off the top that took place on Oak Woodland um, in the area, so we'd be happy to do that. Okay, does anybody have anything else? Okay, so thank you very much, Julia and Grace. I really appreciate you coming and talking to all of us. Um, I, I don't know if everybody can see how many participants there were on this, but we had uh, about 40 people, so that's, that's great. Really appreciate you guys. Um, well, thank you so much for having us. It's, it's been a pleasure and uh, we hope to work with you all again in the future. Yeah, thank you so much. This was really fun. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye. I will end the meeting and I'll be talking to you guys later. Sounds good. Bye.